Hey, everybody. It's so good to be together with all of our campuses today as we're launching a brand new message series called Journey to the Manger. I'm so excited about what God's going to do in our midst over these next four weeks as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. Now, Christmas season has historically been called Advent, and that word literally means to be in waiting. And Christmas season, I know that there's a whole lot of waiting going on with kids getting ready to open Christmas presents on Christmas Day, and there's a lot of waiting happening in different areas of our life, but there's this greater waiting that we're all in. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Romans that all of creation is groaning and looking forward with eager anticipation to the day where it's renewed when Jesus returns. And the Bible actually speaks about, about this reality of the waiting that people were in before Jesus would come. See, Jesus was the fulfillment of many promises in the Old Testament. Close to 300 of them were written about his coming. So during the holiday season, we're waiting for the return of Jesus. We're remembering the birth of Jesus. And we're actually looking at the Christmas story, what was happening before Jesus came. Now, for us as a church family, this is a significant time of year. God does a lot in our church family, in our hearts uh, this is the time of year where more people come to church for the first time than any other time of the year. Uh, this is also the time of year where we're all busy and we got a lot going on, shopping and family events. And I'm believing that this message series is gonna be an opportunity to slow down in the busyness of this holiday season. And so we're gonna have four messages. We're gonna look at four aspects of the journey to the manger and the journey that we're all on. We're gonna look today at the journey of waiting that we're in. Next week, we're going to talk about the journey of searching, that all of us are looking for answers to life's deep questions. In the third week, we're going to look at the journey of discovery, the joy of discovering as you're searching. And then the fourth and final week, we're going to look at the journey of fulfillment and the joy that comes because of Jesus coming to planet Earth. Now, all of these, we're going to look at different snapshots of the Christmas story found in the Bible. And as we do that, uh, each week, we're going to have a journey that we're going to go on during the week through our app. That's the only place that you can get it. It's a little short five-minute video, and some of you have been watching it this week in preparation for the message. So if you're not doing that already, I want to encourage you to do so. And today, as we begin talking about the subject of waiting, I thought it would be good for you to know this last week, I had the privilege of going to Rwanda and I got to see some of the amazing things that God has been doing through our church family in Rwanda for close to 15 plus years now. And as we've looked at God's faithfulness, it's been amazing to see lives that have been changed, pastors that were impacted, communities that were restored, and God's done amazing things. But it also came with some travel for me. It's the fourth international trip that I've been on this year. Got to go to South America to visit our Buenos Aires campus. Stacy and I got to go to uh, over to Asia to visit our Hong Kong campus and Santa Rosa campus there. And then also we went on a trip to Europe. And when I travel, I'm reminded of some things about my personality. And the thing that I'm most reminded of as I'm sitting waiting for an airplane to take off or I'm on a long international flight, I'm reminded that I am not very good at waiting. Now, if I were to do a show of hands and I were to say, how many of you love to wait? Like, very few hands are going to go up. Waiting is often not a very enjoyable experience. But we're all in waiting. And if we're honest with ourselves, waiting is a part of life. It's a part of going to a doctor's office. It's a part of, for you students, you're kind of looking forward to getting out of school and getting to a different place in your life. Some of you who are single are looking forward to being married. Some of you who are parents are looking forward to having kids. Some of you have kids are looking forward to having more time with your spouse in a next, another season of life. But you're looking forward and you're waiting for a future season. Waiting is a part of life. And waiting at its core really is a part of the human experience. Advent, the word advent literally means to wait. And it's the, the word that has been used historically for this holiday season that the church has been in waiting for the return of Jesus. 
And I love a couple of verses I would just want to share with you. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you. This is one of 300 plus prophecies in the Bible that speak of the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus would fulfill them in coming from heaven to earth and ultimately being placed in a manger. And not only is there that longing that was pre-Jesus coming to planet earth, there's that longing in each of us as we look forward to the world being made right again. Romans chapter eight says, against all its will, creation has been subject to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children and glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. And this is important for us because we know something in our world is not right. There's there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of brokenness, both in our own lives and in our world. This year in particular, with the war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, and the war that continues with Russia and Ukraine and all of the brokenness and the loss of life we, we see and we long for this, this day in the future when the world will, will be better, where there'll be peace and joy and not all of this brokenness. And that longing inside of you, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, that longing is placed there by God. And as we're in waiting, the question comes, how, how, do, we, how do we function in the waiting? Because sometimes we don't do great with waiting And sometimes there are people that really do leverage the waiting seasons of their life. Now, I want to give you a couple big ideas. These are probably worth writing down. And when it comes to waiting, uh, I want to encourage you to write down the phrase, we're all waiting for something. So every one of us, as I have already said, we're waiting for something in our life to happen. It might be good to kind of think through, what is that thing that I'm waiting for? And as I'm waiting, this is also another important point worth writing down, waiting is a window of time. So once that window of time is gone, that waiting period, whatever was present in our life in that moment is is gone. Now, you might think of it like if you're stuck in a doctor's office and you're waiting for the doctor to come, maybe there was 15, 20 minutes there, there was an opportunity to read a book or download the Saddleback app and watch the videos for Journey to the Manger. And once that 15 minutes of margin is gone, it's gone. This is true in singleness. Once you're married, that season of singleness is it's gone. This is true before you have kids. Once that's that season, once you have kids, that season of being parents with no kids is gone. And that, that longing inside of our hearts uh, for something in the future oftentimes causes us to miss what is happening in the moment, what God is trying to do in the waiting. In addition, we have responsibility. So while waiting, my responsibility is to actively trust in God. So while I'm waiting, there's something that I can be doing. I can be actively trusting in God. And I wanna unpack today, how do we, how do, we do that as we look at the Christmas story? And as you think about the idea of actively trust, trusting in God, you might compare this to passively trusting in God. Some people kind of just let go, let God, and there's, there's no activity involved. And you might also compare this active trust to people who are active but don't have trust, and they take matters into their own hands. But what we're gonna see today is we look at three snapshots of the Christmas story. God is after a trust that is active. God is after a trust that is moving, and we're gonna see these snapshots of three particular people. And as we walk through, I want us to notice at each of the junctures or points that we look at today that God is working while each of these three people are waiting. And you might write this down. While we're, work, while we're waiting, God is working. While we're waiting in seasons of our life, God is at work. And the first example I want us to look at is Mary. I want us to come to the story of Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, before uh, Jesus was born. Mary was, Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. She's waiting for her marriage to happen, her wedding day to come. 
And it says in chapter one of Luke, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Now, as Mary gets this interruption or this visitation from the angel, the Bible says that she was confused and disturbed. She tried to think what this could mean. Don't be afraid, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. So this is a a good moment. Like God is coming to give you good news, he's telling her. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now imagine being Mary as a young woman receiving this news, trying to figure out how is all of it gonna happen. She's, she's not made yet, that, that moment has not come that she, you know, she walks across, walks down the aisle and gets married to Joseph and commits the rest of her life. She's, she's waiting for that moment and she's wanting to know. So she asked the angel, how will this happen? Mary replied. You know, I'm a virgin is what she says. I, I, I know that most if not all, probably all, we should say, pregnancies in human history have happened in a way that that a husband and a wife or two people were together and that's not happened for me, how's it going to happen? And this is a question, she's got some, some questions around the logistics and the how of what God wants her to do. Do I need to do anything? Do I need to move the marriage forward and get married to Joseph faster? And the angel gives her specifics, says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she's conceived, for the word of God will never fail. Now, this moment of interruption for Mary means a whole lot. Like, she's going to be pregnant. This is going to mean that she's going to have judgment of people Prior to her marriage, her her stomach's most likely showing, and she's got to figure out how to walk through all of these circumstances that she didn't plan for or anticipate. And in the midst of all of this, I want you to notice the heart of Mary. I want you to notice how she responds back to the angel. Mary responded, for I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. May everything that you have said about me come true. I am the Lord's servant. And there's this availability in Mary. There's this surrender in her. There's an openness as she's waiting, as her whole life is gonna be thrown into chaos by this news that the angel has just given to her. Mary surrenders and opens her heart, opens her hands to God. And the first point I wanna encourage you to write down is while I'm waiting, God is working, God is working in me as I'm waiting. As I'm waiting, there are things that God is trying to form and shape inside of my heart. So every season of your life from small waiting to big waiting, the seasons of life, there are things that God does in our lives that only can happen in that season. And when that window is gone, the opportunity that God was presenting before us, it's, it's gone. It's, he's, he's moved us on to another season. And the question that is so good to ask ourselves in this season is in the waiting, what is God trying to form inside of me? There are character traits that God is trying to form. Uh, there, there are, there's the fruit of the spirit that God wants to be born in our lives that comes out of waiting. Waiting is like a soil that God uses that when we're in that soil, the seed of God's word is getting sown in. And if we wait with open hands to God, like Mary to say, whatever it is that you want, may it be unto me what you've said. It allows the soil of our hearts and our lives, our character to be moldable and form, formed by God so that the fruit of his spirit can come out of our lives. Now, I remember specifically, this might give you practically how I've processed this. I remember specifically having somebody in my life that they were like holy sandpaper. Maybe you've heard that term before. Like some people in your life, they, they just it's almost like God put them there to, to get rid of the rough edges on us. And 
you know, every interaction is hard and you're trying to think through how do I, how do I respond to this person? Every response doesn't go the way you want it to. And you always leave the conversation feeling like what just happened in the conversation? You probably have somebody like that in your life. I can remember there was a moment that I was praying about this situation and here's my prayer. God, change them. God, m make them more gracious. God, God help them see all their problems and their issues. And as I was praying this, it was almost as if God spoke to me to say, as you're praying for me to change that person, I'm, I'm actually wanting to change you. So I'm leaving you in the circumstance so that you can be formed, so that you can be shaped. Not, it's not about them, it's about what I wanna do in you. And James would say this in James chapter one, he would say, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And notice this, let perseverance finish its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when I get to another season of life, when we move into the future, there are gonna be things that God did here that prepares my character, prepares your character for what he's gonna place on us there. And if in the window of this moment, I don't see and I don't receive what it is that God is trying to do in me, I'm gonna get down the road and lack the kind of spiritual maturity that God wants me to have. Now, all of us have met people and we don't need to make eye contact or elbow anybody, but all of us have met people in our life that when they got to a future season, you could tell there was a maturity that was lacking, emotional, spiritual, uh, maybe relational maturity. And God gives us opportunities. These seasons of waiting are opportunity for our character to go deeper, for our character to grow and trust in God. And it's out of the perspective that while I'm in waiting, God is working. He's trying to form me. So where is God trying to form you in the waiting? As you're in this season of your life anticipating something that's coming, God is at work in you. Now, not only is God at work in you, but God is also at work, this is the second point, around us. He's, a, he's at work around me in this season of waiting. And the character I wanna look at, the person I wanna look at next is a guy by the name of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth are related to Mary. And Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're old in age. They've been praying for a child for years to come. Uh, it's said that Elizabeth was barren. And so she's been waiting for a child. And you, you'll see in the story that these prayers have gone up to God. God has heard these prayers. And Zechariah, who's a priest, is doing his priestly duties. He's going into the temple. And as he's doing the, his priestly duties, he has a visitation from Gabriel, the same angel that actually visited Mary. And as you notice in Luke chapter one, I'm going backwards on this, verse 11, it says, while he was there in the sanctuary, the angel appeared to him, standing at the right side of the incense altar. And Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. So God's heard that you and Elizabeth have been praying for a child. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him John. And you will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and he will return many Israelites to the Lord. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah and he will prepare people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to the children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So this is the angel that actually told Mary about the coming of Jesus, also telling Zechariah, and this is gonna be John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, that's gonna come and prepare the way for Jesus' coming. And Zechariah, in this instance, has a very different response than Mary. Mary surrendered, but Zechariah looks at the angel and says, how can I be sure that this will happen? How can I be certain? Because I'm an old man now. And my wife, she's, she's old too. She's getting along in years. 
And the angel said to him, not in pleasure. The angel was not pleased with his question. He says, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. And this is how you're receiving it. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Now, God is not pleased with Zechariah's response. He's not going to talk until the baby comes. And what I hope that we can see here, there's a, there's a kind of trust that God was looking for out of Zechariah. Zechariah, in the moment, wanted a level of certainty. He wanted there to be so much specificity about when God was going to do it, how he was going to do it, and most importantly, how could he have certainty in his heart? It flowed from unbelief deep in his heart, as the angel had said. Now, it's important for us to see, for Zechariah and for his wife Elizabeth, as they're in the middle of waiting for a child, God is at work. Now, God is at work in them, for sure, but he's also at work around them. And if you'll notice, there's a whole grand plan that God is bringing about. This grand plan is John the Baptist, who's going to come, he's going to make way, Jesus is going to come behind him. It's all, it's all going to be about Jesus. But there, there was a moment that God had been preparing for, and he had been anticipating. The Bible says that before creation, God was planning this moment. And as he was planning this moment, there were a lot of things that had to get right. There were a lot of prophecies that were being fulfilled. And in Galatians, there's, there's a very powerful verse that talks about in the fullness of time, God, God decides this is the moment to send his son. It says in verse 4 of Galatians 4, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, notice that line. You might want to circle it or underline it. When the, t- the set time had fully come, there was a time in God's mind that was the right time for him to come. There, there were several things that I think are really I- important to recognize. This is the time in history where the Roman road had been paved and cities and towns were more connected. This was a time that there was more common language that had come about. And this was God's chosen time to split history and to come make a way so that we could be received into his family as his sons and daughters. And while Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were waiting, God was working all around them to prepare the ground for this child that would come. There was a a smaller scene, there was a smaller story that God was building in their family inside of a bigger story that God was building for all of humanity and all of history. And the same is true for your life. That There's a story of our lives that God is at work. And sometimes when God is at work in our lives, preparing us personally, as he's at work around us, there are things around us that are not quite ready for what God is preparing us for. Circumstances are shifting and things are getting ready that if, if God were to step you into or call you into it right now, the circumstances would not be ready for what God wants to do through you. So I have peace in my heart when I recognize God's timing, God's plan, God's sovereignty, and his, his orchestrating the events of my life. I can have peace and I can trust. I don't need or have to get answers to every one of my questions so that I can have certainty. In fact, God does not owe me an explanation for his plans. So what he invites me to do is to actively trust him. Now, part of that actively trusting is trusting that his plan, there is a fullness of time for every good thing he's doing in my life. And also, there's a way that I can be involved. Now, there's a good part of Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were praying actively as they were asking God for a son. And that's one of the things that we can do while we're in waiting is that we can pray. And in the waiting, this question I have in your notes is, what does God want me to pray for while I'm waiting? There are things that I can be cooperating with God in as I'm waiting for the future. I'll give you an example of this. I have a mentor that has two sets of twins, and those two sets of twins are just a couple years younger than me. Uh, Those two sets of twins are all in 
vocational ministry serving all over the world. But those two sets of twins, as they came back to back in a couple year period of time, they came to my mentor and his wife. They came in a later season of life after a decade long journey of infertility and praying and asking God to give them children. And one time I was asking this family, I was saying, you know, you guys knocked it out of the park. Four out of four of your kids love Jesus. They're serving with their whole hearts. How, how, how do you make sense of all of that? And uh, the mom said, part of how I make sense of all of it is because in the waiting, I was praying. And there were literally thousands of people that were praying for us to have children. And those four boys, when they were born, they had had so much prayer by the time they had come out of the womb. It was crazy. And God is answering those prayers now. So while they were waiting, God was working around them, but they were also praying, believing that God could orchestrate the events of their lives, believing that God in his grace and his kindness could take care of them. Now, as you're waiting right now, you might find a way to to ask God to give you clarity, like say, God, show me how you want me to pray in this season. What do you want me to be praying for? And I believe that God will prompt your heart. If you're waiting for a spouse, pray that God would give you clarity of the kind of spouse and that God would work in their life. If you're praying and waiting for children, pray for God to move powerfully in the lives of those kids one day. If you're, if you're waiting for healing or you're walking through a medical diagnosis, you can be praying for God's work in his intervention in your life in the midst of that. While you're waiting, as God is working around you, you and I can still be praying. So we're waiting. God is working. God's working in us. God's working around us. But I want to finish with one last piece, and that's that God is working through me as I'm waiting. In every season of life while I'm waiting, God is working And he can work through us in those seasons powerfully. And I love how Elizabeth, the mother that, uh, the wife of Zechariah, who found out that she was going to have a baby, as she goes to Mary, I want you to notice, so she, uh, as Mary comes to her, I should say, Mary comes and travels to Elizabeth in verse 39. And it says, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea where Zechariah lived, and she entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in the womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Notice this woman, Elizabeth, as she is waiting for her baby to come, she's ministering to Mary. So she's in the waiting room. She's in this season where John the Baptist, her baby, is going to be coming in just several months. But as Mary's here at her house, she recognizes the sacredness of this moment, and she has an assignment. Her assignment is to encourage Mary, to love on her, to to literally, as she's in her presence, just to speak affirmation over her. And I actually think that in this season for Mary, this is just a a conjecture for me, part of the reason why Mary went to Elizabeth in this moment is because perhaps in her circumstances at home, it it was chaotic. Imagine her family hearing this news and all the judgment from people around her. But she knew Elizabeth would be a safe place. She knew she could go to this woman and be encouraged and blessed and prayed for. And Elizabeth, as she's waiting, she's letting God work through her. So as we wrap up our time together, I wanna encourage you to genuinely process and think through, what is it that God's trying to do through you as you're in waiting? One of the greatest temptations in waiting is idleness. The Bible speaks over and over again in the New Testament about how often we find ourselves idle when God wants us to be moving. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Paul is speaking to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who's idle 
and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching that you received from us. Sometimes waiting makes us start to think, well, there's nothing I can do because I'm in this place where what I want to do eventually I can't do now. But this is, this is a faulty mindset that will make us miss God's will for our lives, will make us miss from stepping into the fullness of God's purposes for our lives. And I love this quote from John Wesley. It says, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And what he's saying is you can always do good. No matter what situation or circumstance you're in, there's always an opportunity to bear fruit in that season. And there's a kind of fruitfulness that can only come in this window of waiting. I love how Paul seized windows in his life. The great apostle Paul would write from a prison cell and he would say this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what's happened to me has actually caused the gospel to advance. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, because of my circumstance, my waiting, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul was, was still moving. Now, physically, he's not moving, but he's writing letters and sending out encouraging letters to all of the, the churches that he's helped started. And he's sharing the good news of Jesus with the people that he's in prison with. And while he's in prison waiting as a follower of Jesus for his faith, he's letting God use him. Sometimes in our life, when we are chained to a circumstance, we find ourselves chained to a perspective, and that perspective that limits the fruitfulness and the effectiveness of our life is that God can't use me while I'm waiting. And I want to say wholeheartedly to you, there, there will always be parts of our life where we are in waiting. And there are things that we can do now that are preparing for what God wants to do through us in the future. There are things that we can do now that cooperate with God to produce fruitfulness in our life in this season. And when that window is gone, the opportunity, it's no more. I remember right before we moved to Southern California, close to a year and a half ago, uh, we were in the midst of transition, chaos, so much happening in our lives. But there was one neighbor, and I was in waiting to move here, but uh, I, I knew that there was an assignment that God had for me with this one neighbor. And Stacy and I were praying for this family. They, they did not know the good news of Jesus. And as, as we're praying, we, we felt like we needed to have a meal with them. And I was able to give this friend of mine a Bible in his original language. And when I walked away, in the midst of all this waiting I was doing in another place of my life, I felt such a clear sense from God you did the thing that I, I was asking you to do in that moment. There was an opportunity that would be gone as soon as you moved. This guy will, will never be your neighbor again. But there was an opportunity in this moment to show that family love and to share my word with them and care for them. And there are people in your life that maybe you work with them now, but they, they might not be at your company a year from now. Or you're in school with them now and in just a few months, as school's over and you move on, you, you might never see them again. And there are people that God places in our life for a moment that God wants to use our one life to impact their one life. And the holiday season is a great opportunity for us to truly understand that as we're waiting for the return of Jesus, there is a mission that God has for our lives. As we're waiting for there to be no more pain and sorrow and suffering and the promise of eternity with God, God is wanting to use our lives to fulfill the Great Commission. And sometimes God is waiting because there, there are things that he wants to see happen. Now, sometimes the waiting period is because God's not ready. God's saying that there is more that I, I'm, I'm wanting to see done. Second Peter chapter 3 there's such a powerful verse that Peter is speaking. He says, don't forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years 
are like a day. God's not on the same timetable as us. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes it feels like you're in this extended period of waiting, but God, he's not slow. He's moving on his timetable. Sometimes his timetable's faster than us. Sometimes it's slower than we want it to be, but he is not slow, and he is working to fulfill this great commission. And it says, as some people understand slowness, he's not slow. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And as we conclude our time together, I believe that there are some of you today that in the midst of the waiting, what you need to hear is the reason that Jesus has not come back. The reason that creation is longing still for that moment of his return is because God is making an opportunity for you to come home to his heart, for you to receive the gift of salvation. And so this holiday season, I can't think of a better gift that God could give to us than the gift of himself, the gift of salvation and knowing him. And his slowness, the thing that seems slow to us, is him fulfilling a promise to make a way that we can know his heart and give us opportunity to respond. And I'd like to invite you right now to respond by faith in Jesus who died on a cross for your sins and conquered the grave to receive the gift of salvation, to believe in the Lord Jesus who made a way so that you can be right with God, the one that came from heaven to earth, lived lived uh, inside of Israel for 33 years, a perfect sinless life, born into a manger, the one, he he is the one who's made a way so that you can know his heart and today you can receive by faith salvation. I want to encourage you to do that right now. In fact, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. And if that's you right now, I want to encourage you just receive by faith. Just tell God, I believe in you today. I'm choosing to trust in you. And like Mary, I'm surrendering my life to you. Today in this moment, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. And as you do in this moment, he's stepping in. Just a moment, I'm gonna invite you to let us know that you made that decision today to seal the deal of a relationship with God. Others of you, perhaps today as we're still praying in a posture of prayer, there's somebody in your mind that God is bringing to the forefront of your heart, your mind today, that one life. And I wanna encourage you, just take a moment. There's somebody that does not know the good news of Jesus. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, there are people that God is encouraging us in a season of waiting to love, to bring to church, to share his good news with. During the holiday season, people are open to coming to church, come to Christmas services. I wanna encourage you, pray that God would show you that person and that God would give you the boldness to bring them to church with you this Christmas. So Father, in a posture of waiting, we just say we're, We're grateful that you're at work while we're waiting, at work in us, at work around us, and at work through us. And I pray that you would help us be the kind of people that actively trust in you as we're waiting. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.